Welcome back 4060 Warriors. This is Professor Kaufman and we're about to initiate our discussion of signals and signal handlers in Unix. Most of the material that we're going to be covering comes out of Stevens and Rago, Chapter 10. Alternatively, an older textbook, Robbins and Robbins, covers much of what we'll discuss in signals as well in the following sections. Just be making sure that you have a look at homework seven. This wraps up our discussion of virtual memory and examines the PMAP utility. And it also introduces signals, both handlers uh, and how to send signals from one process to another. Uh, some of that will come up in project two, which is still under development. Alas, I have been delayed somewhat in my preparations of it by our shift to online coursework only. I promise to have that out as soon as possible. Our goals for today are to begin a discussion and probably cover the first couple topics, uh, sending signals in C uh, and setting up simple signal handlers. And as we move ahead, we'll see that there are a number of issues that are raised in terms of receiving signals, which arrive at a program at any point. Uh, and that creates a number of problems having to do with the asynchronous nature uh, of signals. In particular, we'll have to be cognizant of the fact that reentrant functions, uh, those that uh, preserve some state from one call to the next uh, potentially create problems uh, when they show up in signal handlers. So uh, let us move ahead and dive into material. Your basic overview of signals is that they're a somewhat old and simple system for delivery of small bits of information from one process uh, to the next. And it's the case that a process or the operating system itself may elect uh, to ask the operating system to deliver a signal to some program. Uh, and then the OS will elect some points in its scheduling routines uh, to deliver that. If the process happens to be running at a given moment, uh, then it may be delivered fairly immediately. On the other hand, if the process is uh, waiting on some IO action, uh, then it may be scheduled to run and it's delivered immediately upon uh, the process actually getting the CPU again. At any rate, processes themselves determine uh, their disposition with respect to signals. They'll have a default disposition and mostly it involves if I get a signal I die, although there are a few uh, uh, exceptions on, on that front. And if this isn't desirable, uh, that you actually want to do something on receiving a specific signal, then you can set up a handler and we'll go over the system calls associated with that. The most important thing that we'll have to discuss though is, and that's after we get through the mechanics, is this asynchronous nature and how uh, the delivery of information at any time in the middle of any other operation creates a number of issues that we'll need to resolve and mostly resolve by trying to avoid them entirely. So we saw early on that there is this kill uh, command line utility, uh, named just K-I-L-L, uh, and we saw that a quick and easy way to eliminate a process that seems to be misbehaving uh, is to issue a kill, uh, 1234, in this case being the process ID for it. There's some variants of this, uh, for instance, uh, some of you are aware there's a key kill routine, which means you don't need to know the process ID for a process, but rather uh, its name. Although pkill kills indiscriminately, uh, if you say pkill on a process like Google Chrome, uh, then you'll be killing all instances out there, maybe not just the one that is uh, misbehaving. There are a couple of variants here that I want to mention because they're starting to become pertinent to our cause. One of the options to the kill utility is which signal to send to a program. And indeed, a kill is not just for murdering things. It's actually in intent, its actual intent is to send signals. Uh, and if you examine uh, the uh, manual page on the equivalent system call, uh, which is also named kill, uh, you'll see that its short description is simply to send signals uh, to a process. So it should come as no surprise that the command line utility in its options allow you to send different numbered or named signals. In particular, the default signal that's sent is called the term signal. It happens to have signal number 15, and we'll see that there is a limited number of signals and they're sort of numbered in order. But you can adjust the numbered signal that is sold, uh, sent to a process uh, by passing either a number or a symbolic name uh, for that uh, signal. Term is considered sort of a gentle way uh, because we'll find that uh, processes can actually receive this signal 
and process it in some way. Usually the request to terminate should be honored, but there may be some cleanup that a pro program has to do. Closing database uh, um, uh, connections, uh, sh uh, closing out files and saving results and so forth, releasing any resources that it's obtained from the operating system that would be uh, unfortunate to sort of lose in a hurry. Uh, to that end, uh, you should pull out the big stick, the kill-9, which is the, the kill signal that ends something immediately, uh, only if it's not responding to other more gentle urgings uh, to, to die. Uh, you'll see then that the uh, system call version of this uh, is found by including a few headers, uh, and the primary items that it takes are more or less equivalent to options that you have to present on the kill utility. That the first required argument to the kill function is the process ID, uh, and the second is a number. Although there are symbolic versions of these included in the C headers as well. For instance, sig kill is this ninth signal uh, that is fairly destructive on that front. There's some other details that are present here, but this is the gist of how one program can send a signal uh, to another one. And it should start to become apparent that this is not really a general purpose communication mechanism, that if there's a certain number of these, uh, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, up to 15, and then a few extra on that, then most of them have a designated intended purpose uh, straight off the bat. You don't necessarily get to choose what that is. Uh, you can, in some cases, choose to interpret it in certain ways, uh, but this is not nearly as general purpose as, for instance, communicating uh, through files or through pipes. Uh, that the, essentially all programs are going to get is that I received a signal uh, to terminate or I received a signal uh, to stop and will behave according to those. I mentioned early on there is this notion of a signal disposition, and this is more or less the standpoint that the process has about how it will interpret a signal. There are a few choices in here, um, and then the general purpose sort of customization of, of them. Uh, so by default, most signals cause termination of a program, uh, this term disposition, as it were. Uh, signals going to also be ignored, and that does no, nothing sort of outwardly that it's received by the program, but no action is taken. Uh, one thing that can potentially happen is the desire to debug what's happening. So you'll see that the disposition according to some signals, if they're received, uh, the program will die, but it will also write its entire memory image as a so-called memory core. Uh, this process of dumping core, as it were, uh, puts something on the disk in the, pro the directory that the program is running in uh, so that you can open that up in a debugger and see what was happening at uh, some point. Uh, you'll see sometimes that uh, Pro, uh, process uh, was uh, killed or dumped corp, and in some cases you may wish to attempt to debug at that point. Stop is a signal or a disposition which causes the uh, process to close down. Uh, uh, sorry, not close down entirely, but to pause execution. Uh, and the operating system won't schedule it to run again until it receives uh, a continue uh, signal. Uh, and this disposition uh, associated with continue is most closely associated with a signal, a sig cont that we'll see in just a second. Most of these dispositions uh, can be adjusted somewhat through the use of signal handlers, and we'll, we'll see that in just a second. Uh, but just for completeness, uh, here are the most common signals uh, that show up along with their number uh, in the sort of Unix parlance. Uh, some of these have some historic, uh, historical um, relevance, uh, and others uh, are see still widespread use. Uh, we've mentioned already, uh, for instance, sig kill is number nine. Uh, we'll also see that uh, sig int uh, and sig term down here are somewhat important. We'll also encounter later on uh, an alarm signal, uh, which is uh, the, uh, there's an associated system call to ask that the program be notified via a signal uh, after some time has elapsed and this sig alarm uh, is the signal that the operating system will send with that so we'll study this alarm function uh, sometime later occasionally you'll see problems with uh, pipes as in uh, if a program is making use of a pipe and the other program it's communicating with uh, is misbehaving in some way, closing a pipe for instance, uh, you may get a signal for that. Although in some other cases, uh, the, so you have to request to some extent uh, that those signals actually be issued. Uh, in other cases, you'll just see that uh, files were closed and can behave normally on that front. 
Should also be noticed that this column uh, is an x86 uh, set of values. And so uh, the numbers here correspond specifically to the processor in the Intel uh, family. Other processors, for instance, MIPS or ARM, uh, they actually have different numbers associated with uh, signals. Uh, and it's up to the kernel. In this case, this is a listing for the Linux kernel uh, to decide exactly what the specific numberings are. Uh, to that end, it's probably best in most cases to use the symbolic names like SIGCONT or CONT uh, rather than the numbers as they may vary from one processor to the next. So then let's talk about uh, what some of these guys uh, uh, do uh, and hopefully avoid any uh, SIG, SEG Vs uh, for segmentation faults on that front. Um, it's uh, the case that in a lot of situations, a quick and dirty way to kill a program is while it's running to press Control C. And the default response in most terminals is to send the SIG int uh, to a running program. Now, if you look back at the default dispositions uh, for these, you'll see up top that if you don't do anything special, the way most programs respond to the uh, SIG int is to terminate. Um, so you can sort of demonstrate this on a terminal, for instance, uh, I'll fire up terminal here, uh, just increase the size a little bit. Uh, and if we fire up our friend yes, which is this program that just spits out Y's continuously, uh, and I press Control C at this point, I get a copy. Uh, I just see that uh, this is terminated, it's uh, received the SIG int, and it doesn't do anything out of the ordinary to handle this, so it, uh, it shuts down uh, more or less immediately. Uh, there are a few other sort of interactive programs that you can get to do that. Uh, I'm trying to think of one like, for instance, if I fired up an editor like gedit over here, uh, it's off over here on the side. And if I move it aside for a second and move this over here, uh, and I say something like, hello world, uh, but then over here in the terminal, I press the control C, uh, it dies right away uh, and uh, probably hasn't saved any of the text file that, that I was interested in doing. So, and it's a good keystroke to be aware of because by default, most programs are terminated uh, with that control C bit of business. Uh, it is the case though that not all programs may want to terminate on that front. Uh, and so there's a facility within the operating system to ask uh, that programs, rather than handle things in the default way, handle thing, things in a more customized fashion. Um, so there's a system call that we'll introduce now, and I actually advocate that you not use it, and we'll talk about alternatives in a minute. Uh, but the simplest way to set up a signal handler uh, is via this signal system call. Its two arguments are a signal number to handle, and then a function to run whenever that signal is returned. And so the basic structure of a program that has some signal handling facilities is that in a main or some other function that wants to set up the handling, uh, and usually this happens near the beginning of the program, so main's a good choice, there'll be a call to signal. Uh, and within it, uh, the, the source code someplace, uh, there will be a function that's designated as a signal handler for one or more sig uh, signals. Uh, it's the case that these signal handlers, they have a void return value. And essentially they're gonna be called to handle the signal and then control is returned to wherever you left off in the program. The only other thing to know about them is that they take an integer, which will be populated with the integer value of the signal that's being called. Uh, so I can actually have a single handler that handles several things, uh, several signals, because uh, I can discern between them uh, using the integer up here. So uh, let's see how this plays out in action. Uh, we saw early on in the course, this little no interruptions uh, program. And so I'll fire up the source code for that and you can have a look uh, first at how the signal handling uh, framework sort of starts up uh, and then we'll see how it actually plays out in the terminal. Um, so over here is uh, that program, no interruptions.c put some line numbers up just so I can reference those as we speak. There are two handlers up top that are named fairly obvious stuff, uh, handle sig int and handle sig term. And what you can see is all they really do is call some print functions and then flush uh, the standard out so that it appears on the screen sooner rather than later. At the top of the main for this no interruption signal program are two calls to this signal uh, function, which establish for sig int, call this function handle sig int, and for sig term, call this function handle sig term. Uh, 
The program then goes into this infinite loop where it sleeps for a second and then prints out this mana na na uh, phrase and then flushes it to standard out. So I'll pull up a terminal over here in Emacs and uh, jump over there. Uh, let me just put the terminal sort of in a state that's a little narrower so we can see everything. Uh, and then I'll GCC this uh, no interruption signal version. And we'll look at a couple variants of this in a moment. So there, uh, look for those uh, present in the source code pack uh, as well. Uh, that should give me an A dot out. And actually, just to make my life a little bit easier, I'm gonna call this uh, no uh, inter uh, as the output program. Uh, that'll give me an easier way to kill it later on. So uh, I'll then run this no inter uh, program. Uh, and you'll see down here, it's every second is gonna print out to manana. -na. Uh, and if down here, I try that keystroke control C, and I should mention I have to type something slightly more awkward in Emacs, but uh, don't concern yourself with it. Try to send it a control C, uh, then you'll see it respond with the code that is associated with this handle sig int. Uh, which is just to respond by printing something and then carry on. This is an effective way then to essentially ignore uh, that interrupt signal that normally terminates programs. Uh, this is handling it as it were, but more or less ignoring the default action, which is to terminate uh, by simply printing something out. It was, uh, out instead. Uh, you could alter the code in here to, for instance, exit or something like that if uh, you were so inclined. Uh, and here it would require an exit rather than a return because return is just going to return control back to wherever you left off in main, wherever the interruption actually happened. Uh, but you can see that this program is happily just uh, uh, ticking along uh, down here. Uh, let me fire up another uh, let's see, shell over here and uh, we can attempt to be a little bit more forthful in this, but since the control Cs like, are not uh, hacking it in terms of stopping this thing from going, uh, you might try, for instance, uh, to kill it or key kill it. Uh, I call this no inter. Uh, and you'll see that, like the sig int, uh, the termination signal is being handled, as it were. And I, if you can't tell, I'm saying handled with air quotes around it because this is sort of a rude way uh, to handle a quest, please terminate yourself. Um, and uh, to that, we might have to take more uh, uh, stronger actions to get this thing to actually end. Uh, so uh, the peak killing here is also uh, not working. Uh, the control C is not working. And in cases that you have programs that are sort of belligerent on, on this front, uh, then you'd probably want to pull out the uh, kill signal, uh, which does get rid of the, the program uh, immediately. So then, uh, with that in mind, uh, that it's not terribly hard to set up uh, signal handlers on this front, uh, and you can do more or less whatever you want in signal handlers, but we'll add a bunch of prescriptions for things you really ought not to do in there, including printing, it turns out. Uh, we are in good shape now to sort of start talking about some other aspects of, of uh, signals. Um, the first thing to sort of tout is that signals being this sort of old uh, bit of business, uh, they were present at a time when Unix was yet to be standardized. And so there were a bunch of different things that folks had in mind in terms of how signal handling should do and different branches of Unix sort of had different ways that they uh, were, they, they appeared and were implemented in the operating system kernel. Uh, for instance, you will see associated with this signal uh, function that sets up a signal handler um, that in a lot of literature on this, it's prescribed that the very first thing a signal handler should do uh, is to reestablish the handler. Uh, as in every time a signal handler is run, it's sort of lost from the record in the operating system of that signal handler being associated with it. And so you need to reestablish the association at the very beginning of the, the signal handler. While a minor irritation, uh, this sort of bit of business could be swallowable, except that it still is sort of broken here. And if you need some help to think about why is this sort of subtly awful, then you just need to think uh, more so in terms of um, what could possibly go wrong and take a very pessimistic attitude on this. And uh, here's what could happen. Uh, if you establish this signal handler initially, uh, and which overrides the default behavior of the program to die if it gets an, uh, an interrupt signal, uh, 
uh, and someone says, sends an interrupt signal, uh, you might wind up up here in the signal handler, hoping that the very first thing that happens is I've lost in this old version of Unix uh, the association of interrupts uh, to this signal handler, so I'll immediately reestablish it. Some pernicious user is going to send a whole lot of interrupt signals so that as soon as the signal handler starts, that handles incorrects and it's lost this association, you get another interrupt and then the default action, uh, which is to terminate the program, uh, uh, takes over and you never get any of the signal handler action here. Now you notice that uh, despite how much I jammed control C, that didn't happen. Uh, and in truth, in most modern Unix systems, you don't have to do this. That's once you establish an association of an, a signal to a signal handler, uh, you do not have to reestablish it every time uh, the, the program is signaled. Thank goodness for that. Uh, but you should take a little bit of care because there are a few wacky Unix systems out there that still obey this part. And so in order to be compliant with them, uh, you might actually have to code this in order for it to be completely portable. Uh, I haven't seen enough Unices outside of Linux to know for sure how widespread that is, uh, but beware on that front and consider using the alternative we'll introduce in a few minutes, uh, which is much more robust as it was introduced after Unix standardization started. The other historical note uh, is that in some implementations of Unix, uh, the sort of whole idea of interrupting using signals was taken maybe to a sort of deleterious extreme, and that uh, even system calls could be interrupted. Uh, and if you were to have a look at the Robbins and Robbins text, uh, they spend oodles of time sort of discussing this. Um, basically what it boils down to is any system call you'd want to make ever could potentially be interrupted by a signal which kicks you out of the system call and it's not having completed, you're re-obligated uh, or obligated to restart it. Uh, and so even simple things like I want to do a single read uh, down here, you have to essentially put in some sort of a loop uh, where you're checking the return value uh, to see did I come out of this normally or did it error out? And if it errored out, uh, did uh, the, um, uh, let's see, did, did it error out because it was interrupted uh, due to a signal? So I think this logic is correct that um, if you uh, return and you don't have a negative one, then it completed normally and you break. Uh, but if you got a negative one, uh, then check uh, if it, it returned because of this interrupt. If it wasn't an interrupt, uh, then you uh, break. Oh, I should see, uh, have a not equal here. So apologies if I'll fix that in the slide. Uh, at any rate, I, I hope you catch my drift here that this is terribly tedious, uh, that anytime you wanted to do a single system call, be it a read or a write or a fork or any of that stuff, uh, then you're subject to trying to handle signals gracefully in, in this front. Uh, and to that end, you can understand why some Unix implementers, in particular like uh, Linux, uh, does not follow this convention that uh, system calls are usually automatically restarted uh, on receiving some sort of signal without you having to do anything. We'll also see then uh, that the alternative uh, function called sig action uh, to signal allows you to specify this as an explicit action of uh, part of the signal handling mechanism. So all that to say then that this signal function, which establishes signal handlers, is pretty easy to use, uh, but in terms of portability, it utterly sucks. And if you look at the manual page for it, uh, and you have to look uh, in, I think, man two on signals gives you, um, rather than overview of signals, uh, the information specifically about this system call, then you should avoid its use uh, and it's not the function you want uh, for signal handling business. Uh, in here, it directs you straight towards what you should be using instead, uh, this SIG action system call. Instead, it's a bit newer, it has a whole raft of other options and is generally more portable. So with that in mind, let us have a look at this alternative, which admittedly is a little bit harder to set up, but is still going to get the job done uh, and is there is safer. Um, so this portable version then involves a couple things. First, there's a struct that uh, alas is also called a sig action struct. Uh, you can set one up on the stack like this and the open close parens here, uh, the curlies, they are a sort of slightly non-standard way of setting all the values in the struct to be zero to begin with. 
Uh, you would then set up the most important field uh, with this uh, by the SA handler, uh, as in the SIG action, its handler field, uh, to be some function that you want to handle signals. Then uh, one would probably initialize uh, one and other important field, uh, the signal mask here, uh, that we'll talk about at a later point. Uh, set up important flags like this want to restart system calls. And then call sig action a few times, as we did with signal, uh, using the number of the signal that you want to handle uh, and passing in this struct as the uh, argument to it. Uh, we'll talk maybe a little bit more later about this last null argument, but it's not of great consequence at the moment. So, as an alternative to that no interruption signal, here is the no interruptions sig action. Uh, we can put those next to each other. Uh, no interruptions. Uh, sig action. Uh, and I think I'll just try and get this lined up uh, over here so you can see the code is a bit longer, uh, but otherwise more or less the same structure. So in our first few lines, you have the signal handler functions, handle sig int and handle sig term. Uh, and then in the main itself, you have the same basic setup uh, of eventually wanting to call sig action twice. Uh, I took the liberty of just setting the signal handler uh, to be one of the two functions, uh, handle sig term for this first call and handle sig int uh, for the second call. Uh, and it can reuse the same struct in both cases just by changing the particular field of interest that varies between these two, this uh, SA handler. Then jump into that infra loop for printing uh, and get more or less the same effect that we had a moment ago. Uh, I will GCC this no uh, interruption sig action. That's it. Call that uh, no enter uh, and then run it once more. And you can see the phenomena uh, comes out a bunch of times. The control C's aren't working over here in my second shell. Uh, I can attempt sort of standard uh, term kills uh, by name or by uh, sort of symbol. Uh, and finally, I eventually have to issue the, the kill signal to actually get rid of that thing. So while slightly more troublesome, you can already see allusions to the fact that there are a bunch more options on here uh, that were uh, added to SIG action expressly to solve some of the portability problems associated with the different Unix implementations. And by passing in the correct set of options, you can specify an exact set of behavior uh, that is desired associated with SIG action. A couple other things uh, to mention, uh, aside from just establishing your own signal handler that may or may do something that's compliant with the intent of a signal, uh, you can also mess around a little bit with uh, some symbols uh, sig ignore and sig default to set or reset uh, the de sort of default actions or set explicit ignoring of, uh, of stuff associated with uh, signals. Uh, we should look just quickly at this no interruptions ignore version of the code. Uh, this also, uh, and I'll pull up that uh, sig action over here, this also makes use of sig action uh, but uses some special signals uh, that uh, s special symbols rather uh, to get a, either ignore or a default action associated with um, uh, associated with the signals. Uh, so over here, rather than set up uh, the uh, where am I looking? Uh, say restart. Let's see. This is ig ignore. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, I'm just trying to find the ignore. Ah, here it is. Okay, okay. The handler. Sorry. Uh, got a little distracted there. Uh, rather than assign a function here to my uh, SA, the SA handler, uh, this is that field associated with uh, the function that's supposed to run for it, you can use the special thing uh, sig ignore, and this will, uh, in, uh, instead of doing anything explicit, just catch the signal and do nothing with it. So the program continues unaltered. Uh, 
To that end, I don't need any special functions up here as I did on the left-hand side associated with how exactly the signals can be handled uh, because this signal, um, sig ig, uh, is short for ignoring and will just discard the signal uh, and not kill the program or anything like that. Uh, so the initial sig actions here that are set up are associated with that. Uh, after going for five iterations here, we're gonna actually change the behavior with respect to sig term and sig int back to the defaults, and that's where this sig dfl uh, business comes in. And if you recall, the default for both those things was to die. Uh, so if I bop over to a shell here and GCC this no interruptions, uh, let's see, ignore.c, the only outward change, and I'll just run this as, now I better, better actually <laughs> Give the uh, see out no inter here so I can kill it easily. Um, the only outward change that you'll see uh, is that control C's, they don't have any sort of response uh, to them. Um, uh, and the do 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 that is uh, uh, mentioned over here, that's associated with the change at you know, five seconds later uh, from the normal or so the ignoring of signals back to their normal default behavior which is to kill so that's why the control c down here actually did stuff i didn't see any printing or anything over here because the behavior one receiving this control c is just to ignore it so not to print or do anything special on that front so then uh, we have a few tricks then uh, up our sleeve and i'll encourage you for most of the code that you write and the code that we present henceforth we'll be making use of this sig action function instead uh, it's worthwhile to maybe talk a about a few more details associated with it, uh, but we'll get there in just a second. There are a couple other things uh, to mention uh, quick that uh, the act of sleeping, and we've seen this with this sleep system call, which will put a process to sleep uh, for a few seconds. Uh, this actually is a request to the operating system for, to temporarily suspend the program from being scheduled. Uh, so it moves it out of the run queue, uh, and after some time, the CPU or the, the kernel will move it back into the scheduler to get time for the CPU eventually. So at a minimum, those no interruption programs are gonna be taken out of the run queue and put just on hold for a second. There's a, a sort of interesting facet to this that a signal will actually wake the program up. And so you may actually get more output uh, than one per second in those um, versions of the program that were um, sort of printing things as you go through. Uh, that a sleep for five seconds, for instance, if you receive a signal after two seconds, this actually brings the program back into the run queue uh, so that this, the operating system can, can deliver the signal to it. Uh, it's the case that there's one other interesting function, a pause that's associated with this. It's equivalent to a sleep of zero. It essentially means sleep or pause until I receive a signal. And there are a few cases in which one might want to pause for some reason uh, indefinitely until some other program, for instance, signaled that it's safe to proceed. We don't have any cause to use that at the moment, uh, but signals as a coordination mechanism uh, open up some interesting possibilities. Generally, what I understand about this stuff is that you're much better off using other standard I.O. mechanisms due to the uh, squirreliness of signals. Um, there is also a notion of stopping and continuing associated with signals, and this is slightly different than um, the sort of pause uh, bit of business here. Uh, a signal to stop is uh, associated with a program being put on hold uh, indefinitely until it receives a signal to continue. This is more or less how job control works. Uh, that's what we've seen in terms of things on the terminal uh, that you can make use of uh, to suspend and then resume a program using control Z and then uh, foreground, uh, for instance. Uh, this is implemented usually through uh, signals along those lines. Uh, so it's possible to sort of observe this in the wild via a couple of uh, different mechanisms. First, I'll recall that uh, uh, terminal control business. Um, and over here, uh, we need a proper terminal for this. Uh, if I do the yes bit of business and then type the control stroke control Z, uh, this sends a sig stop to that uh, yes program. 
and uh, it can issue it, uh, ask it to continue using foreground in the shell. Um, but I can also, let's see, if I remember, kill uh, sig cont uh, to job number one, uh, this will bring it back to the foreground as well. Essentially, uh, those are uh, two things are the same thing. Unfortunately now, uh, the continuing hasn't actually taken over my terminal uh, that uh, I can't uh, get control back on this one because while the job was in the background, I actually didn't get control in the terminal back associated with this. So uh, I could be typing like ls, uh, but uh, the output associated with yes is flying by so fast uh, that I can't actually see it. And I can't suspend it anymore either. So I think it's time to just uh, nix this terminal at this point. The other example I want to show quick uh, is this start and stop uh, bit is associated with this uh, circle of life program. Uh, circle of life shows up in your lab, or sorry, your homework uh, work as well. It's just a program that spits out some output over time. Uh, let's pull that up over here. Uh, and if you need a little refresher on uh, Disney stuff, uh, then you may want to look back and see if you can uh, fish out where these lyrics are coming from. Uh, but I'll digress on that and leave you to do your own internet research on that part. Uh, let's see, so uh, GCCing that, and I'll call it Circle of Life, uh, so that's good. Uh, and if I run this thing, uh, it's just going to spit some output out, wait a second, and then spit some more output out. Uh, nothing particularly special there, not even any signal handlers over here. Uh, the intent then of this program is just to generate output over time in a sort of meaningful way. And we'll contrast it with this, uh, let's see, start stop business, uh, which is present here. Uh, this is an interesting program in that it brings back into the uh, discussion this fork business that we talked about earlier that allows you to start up a child process. Uh, and in this case, all I'm going to do is to take a child program name, uh, which is going to be forked off, and also then an interval. Uh, and this interval will dictate how long I let the child run uh, and then I'll issue a stop uh, to sleep for a little while uh, and then repeat that process over and over again. Uh, so if I GCC this start stop, I'll call the output start stop, I'll run start stop with circle of life as the child program and I'll maybe say every three seconds I'll issue start stop. So P about the first three messages uh, and then the sig stop is issued. We wait for a little while and then issue a continue which starts uh, the child program uh, up running again. So every three seconds you see a burst of lines and then a pause as the uh, start stop program sends out this sig stop uh, and then a sig continue as it will pick up again. Uh, so I don't think we need to dwell upon that any other, uh, but this starts to elucidate how a terminal, uh, like um, this GNOME terminal that I was using a moment ago, or even the Emacs terminal that I have up here, um, how it can enable the job control that you see. Typically this is, comes from not just the terminal itself, but the underlying shell like bash, uh, which is responsible for most of the job management and the signal delivery uh, stuff uh, that, that's present there. There are a couple exceptions to the signal handling mechanism that you need to be aware of and can probably understand the reasons behind. Uh, the sig kill and sig stop signals cannot have their default dispositions changed. Uh, so sending a sig kill, that's dash nine, it always terminates a process. Uh, and in order to enable robust job control, uh, sig stop always pauses a program. Uh, and you can resume it later on, uh, but the mere stopping uh, part is always guaranteed. The delivery mechanism associated with this is signals, but generally this has to do with operating, uh, operating system policy in that you want to be able to get rid of misbehaving programs or at least put them on hold for a little while. That's why at the user level, asking for SIG action or signal to uh, sort of handle something that is number nine or associated with SIG stop, uh, these calls will actually fail. Uh, and you can see that in the can't handle kill uh, program. Uh, let's pull that up uh, just quick. Can't handle kill. 
Uh, down here, we attempt to set up a handler that ignores uh, and associate that with the SIG kill. Uh, what you'll be looking for then is like a lot of other system calls, SIG action return code. It will indicate success or failure associated with that handling. Uh, down here, if we ever got there, we'd be in a good position to manana -na forever. But we'll see that on compiling and running this thing, uh, you don't actually ever make it that far because uh, the attempt to handle SIG kill is rejected by the operating system. You could you know, move on from here, uh, but any sort of normal disposition uh, that we couldn't change for SIG kill, uh, that would still be uh, present here. Uh, so down here, if I just remove the exit, uh, GCC it again, fire this uh, uh, ADOT out up again, uh, you get the error message up here, uh, and I can very much uh, interrupt this thing, uh, term it, uh, and I very much still can, uh, let's see, p kill uh, the a dot out that's running, um, and that's uh, dead where it stands now. So uh, to that end, uh, you don't have to fret about nefarious users putting onto your uh, your operating system programs that can't seemingly be killed. So long as you have permission uh, to kill programs, uh, you'll always be able to do so. I should mention just quickly, uh, this signal delivery mechanism where you state, here's a process ID and I want to send a signal to it. It's subject to a lot of the other operating system permission structure uh, that's present elsewhere. We've seen this applies to um, the, let's see, the file system uh, most readily, like you look at files and you have read and write permissions on them, but they're owned by certain people. So there's this distinction between users and groups and, and so forth. Uh, we've seen also that memory, to some extent, has read, write, and execute permissions associated with it. Uh, it's also the case that processes have some notion of what you can and can't do with them. Certainly, if you're the owner and have started a process, uh, then you can issue signals to it. Uh, but there are some processes that other users uh, own that if you don't have the right permission set up, for instance, sharing the group ID uh, with that process, then you won't be able to deliver any signals to it. The operating system will reject that. So with all this in mind then, with the sort of basics associated with signals, it's good probably just to review at this point, uh, to take a moment, uh, to identify this is the set of stuff that you can do with signals, but why would I do various things? Like what are they actually useful for if they're sort of a limited piece of information? So I'd encourage you at this moment just to think back, how have we seen them used? Uh, and what do you think they could potentially also be used for uh, as we move ahead? I've mentioned a few of these that are common uh, that we haven't actually seen in code yet, uh, but uh, there are probably others if you let your imagination run wild enough. Uh, there'll be some chance for us to talk about this in our discussion together on Zoom uh, later tomorrow. And so there'll be some bonus credit involved for associated with folks who can actually pitch some creative uses for signals. I'll take a moment just to take a breath right now, and then we'll resume with uh, some quick discussion of my answers to this. All right, that's probably long enough to mull this one over. A couple of things that we talked about, uh, killing programs certainly ranks highly on the use for signals. I mean, the name of the system call and the command line utility kill is sort of indicative of one of their main intents. We've also seen then that job control is enabled uh, via this sig stop and sig cont in order to bring things back. So those are super useful in terms of controlling whether or not you're going to let a process you own continue executing or not. Uh, we have seen that uh, sig term and sig ints being these gentle ways to shut things down. Uh, programs can actually catch those. And unlike that manana business, uh, a more common use of them is to gently indicate you should shut down now because we need you to. And that gives the program an opportunity to save files, close network connections, uh, write to the database, uh, anything that it needs to flush out. Um, many programs with sensitive data like that uh, will often need a chance to do so. And sig term and sig int are often the signals that are associated with that. 
that. Uh, the particular mechanism to do so uh, is program dependent, but there are a few things that we'll want to sort out from that front once we talk about this issue of uh, reentrancy. Um, so stay tuned for that. You can perform a limited amount of sort of call and response uh, to coordinate program behaviors. Uh, but I'll caution you that signals are not great for this, uh, that it's extremely tricky uh, to set up protocols that are based on signaling back and forth. We'll talk some more later on about uh, more complex or robust uh, inter-process communication mechanisms. Signals are our first example of this, but generally they're not well suited for any sort of complex coordination between programs. Uh, and so I'll encourage you, rather than try and get too wild with their use, uh, to limit the discussion that you have of them uh, and uses of them to the kinds of things that we've talked about here. That's probably good enough for the moment. Uh, the last little bit I want to talk about before uh, breaking for this evening and uh, moving on in our next session to discuss uh, some of the other parts of signals uh, is just to talk about the additional options associated with this uh, sig action uh, function. Uh, we saw that its primary argument is this uh, struct sig action here. And that struct are the primary vehicle uh, where you can convey information uh, about how you want signals handled. Uh, so again, uh, the typical setup is you establish one of these structures uh, and then you uh, fill in the fields with it before calling sig action with a signal number and then the structure associated with uh, the values you popped in there. So most of how sig term in this case will be handled will be dictated by the stuff that's in this struct. Uh, there are present in here uh, two fields associated with functions, and we've talked about one of them, uh, this SA handler uh, field. And this is the sort of traditional, I just take a signal number, uh, signal handler function. Uh, the interesting type specification for this field, uh, a void star uh, and then an int, this weird sort of parenthesis is actually necessary because this is uh, a function handle or a function pointer as it were. And the meaning of this is that uh, the void is the return type. The star is I am a function uh, or pointer to a function that takes a single int argument. Um, the stuff in between we'll talk about in just a second, uh, but I want to contrast that with the last field, uh, which is actually an alternative, uh, somewhat more robust mechanism uh, that establishes a different signal handler function. So you'd leave this one empty, uh, null in a lot of cases, and instead pass a function uh, in this third field, this SA sig action, if you wanted more information about the signal as it was delivered. We won't have time to go into the details of this, uh, but just as a sort of teaser on that front, uh, that if you set the flags in some of the previous fields right, then you can get things in uh, this particular more complex invocation function, like who was the process that sent me this signal? And this can be more interesting to use than if you're trying to set things up. Uh, generally, this function would take three arguments instead. Uh, the int, which is the signal number, uh, a struct that will be populated by the OS as it delivers the signal, uh, which is this sig info t uh, business, uh, and then a void pointer to something that I frankly can't remember at the moment. But uh, all that is present in the manual for sig action uh, if you're so inclined to look at it. Uh, we won't have much cause to do stuff that's more complex uh, than what you've seen so far uh, in terms of signalers, so we won't have any need to use this one. But if you get out there in the wild and find the need uh, for more robust and interesting signal handling uh, uses, then this would be a good one to look into. We'll talk in the next session about the uses of this SA mask business. Aside from handling signals, you can also make requests to the process to completely block them. The meaning of blocking is that the signals are still pending, uh, and when the signals are unblocked, they'll be delivered to a process, but for a moment, they won't be delivered to a process and it won't be interrupted. Uh, to that end, we'll see its use in sort of critical regions where you cannot, for one reason or another, stand to be interrupted by a signal be delivering. Uh, the other uh, sort of set of flags uh, that are associated with this SA action can do things like automatically restart uh, system calls. Uh, we saw that SA restart used. There are a few other uh, tricks that you can throw into this one that are specified in the manual, but by far uh, SA restart is the most common that I've seen in anyway.
So this concludes our initial foray into signals. In the following session, uh, we will continue and discuss some additional details, such as all the things that you're really not supposed to do in signal handlers. Uh, and they are quite numerous on that front. It'll require a discussion of this notion of what a re-entrant function is, uh, but we'll get there when we get there. Uh, until then, happy hacking, folks.